not why God's wondrous grace to me He had made known No why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for His own But I know whom I believe in And am persuaded that He's able To keep that which I committed unto Him a little bit I know not how this saving faith to me did impart nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart but I know whom I believe in and am persuaded that he's able To him against that day, I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men I see, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in Him. But I know whom I believe in, and am persuaded that He is in. committed unto him against that day but I know whom I believe in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day silences the enemy let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety let it arise let praise arise we sing your name in the dark and it changes everything we sing with all we are and we claim your victory This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. 
we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you we'll see you break down every wall we'll watch the giants fall for fear cannot survive when we praise you the god of breakthroughs on our side forever lift him i with all creation cry god we praise you surrender 
Thank you for that good singing. Yeah. You understand what they were saying about break down the walls of my religion. It's talking about religious ritual that you think can somehow earn you brownie points with God. And of course, it's all through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and God's revealed word as opposed to man's efforts to earn his way into good standing with God. It's a good song. Good song. Good singing. Yeah. The Apostle Peter. Hmm. I'm looking forward to meeting the guy. I mean, really something else. But uh, today's passage is going to be about the actual call to apostleship. The, uh, the guys had been meeting with the Lord before and they'd been learning from him. Like in John chapter 1, John the Baptist said it the second time when he pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And one of the men that he said it to was Andrew. And Andrew went and got his brother Simon, who would later be called Peter. And that's what Jesus said. Well, you're Simon, but one day you're going to be called Peter, which means rock, you know. And then you've got Jesus teaching and Jesus doing miracles, and you've got the apostles keeping track. But then later in um, Luke chapter 5, it speaks about Peter being told, launch out your boat a little bit from the shore so I can teach from your boat because there's a multitude of people in front of me. And, and he does his teaching and it says that it's really authoritative, that it's not like the scribes who are always quoting each other and quoting rabbis. Jesus kept saying, this is what I say and this is what the word says. And uh, then, of course, there was a miraculous catch of fish. And they had fished all night. And middle of the day, you, you know, the fish are down on the bottom unless the Lord makes them come up. And miraculous catch of fish, and Peter said, what? Depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. You know, he knew that Jesus had done a very miraculous thing there. And then Jesus said, don't be afraid, someday you're going to be catching men. You know, and you, you, that makes it sound like Christians are predators and non-Christians are prey. But, you know, when you're catching men, what are you actually doing? You're wanting them to be a part of your family part of the forever family of God. You want him to, to become your brother and become your sister, to be a, a joint heir with you, to have a wonderful fellowship. One of the fishermen was, of course, the apostle John, and he said, what we've seen and heard, we declare to you so you can have fellowship with us. You know, so if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, we're fishing for you because <laughs> we want you to be our brother. <laughs> We want you to be our sister. We want you to be in our family. We want to have fellowship with you. And it's better than being buddies, you know. One body in Christ. Um, one big, happy, forever family. That's what we want. And so that's what Jesus was saying. But how did Peter do? You know, uh, henceforth you'll be fishing for men. Well, when Jesus was being tried that night and was going to be crucified the next morning, what did Peter do? Did he fish for men? Well, he denied that he even knew Jesus. He failed miserably. But then after the resurrection of Jesus, after he was crucified, he appeared to the disciples several times. And in John 21, John says this is the third time that Jesus appeared to them. And they, they've gone fishing, and they fished all night again. And they caught nothing fishing all night again. How many of you men have done that before? You know, I've fished all night and caught nothing. Uh, my cousin Mike caught me right here one time. But anyway, that's beside the point. But, and then what did Jesus do? He said, well, throw it over the right side of the boat. And they caught so many fish that it took two boats to drag it to the shore. And then Jesus said, Peter, you denied me before, but when the opportunity comes for you to lay your life down for me, you're going to do it this time. You're not going to fail. Now, this Simon Peter who had denied the Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of Jewish officials, what did he do on the day of Pentecost after the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles? He said to the very people who were responsible for crucifying Jesus plus thousands of others because they were there for the Feast of Pentecost, he said, this Jesus whom you crucified is risen and we're witnesses. And God has made him both Lord and Christ. So he fished for men. Now, this passage, I want to emphasize something here. There was Simon Peter who was told, you're going to fish for men, and he failed. But then after the resurrection of Christ, and then after Christ sent the Spirit, 
to indwell believers, he didn't fail. And so I want to emphasize in this passage where Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. You see, there's a difference between go out and fish for men and I'll make you fishers of men. In other words, Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, did something in the heart of Peter that he wants to do in the heart of every believer. Now, believers in Jesus, brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I are not, we haven't been suggested that we fish for men. We've been commanded to. In the Great Commission, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I commanded you. He commanded them to go fish. Then he says, now you command other believers to do the same thing. The reason that there are Christians multiplied over the face of the earth is because there are believers who take seriously the command by the Lord Jesus Christ to be fishers of men. But he makes you fishers of men. That's why the Apostle Peter, bless his heart, all of his failings are in Scripture. Wouldn't you love to have all of your failings in God's Word so that a bunch of people could read it? Poor guy. But the point was, here is Simon, son of John, Simon Barjona, and he's a failure. And then here is Simon Barjona who, when it was time for him to be crucified, said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like the Lord was. Crucify me upside down. What was the difference? Jesus made him a fisher of man. Now, Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. This is not his first encounter. You know, if you were just reading the book of Mark, you don't read anything else, you would think, that's really weird. They're out there fishing, and then along comes this stranger and says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they go, oh, okay. You know. No, they'd have several encounters, including the miraculous catch of fish. And the reason that there was the miraculous catch of fish was he was making a point with Peter. On your own, you're not going to catch anybody. It's going to have to be with the help of my Holy Spirit. Listen to John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me, and you will testify also, because you've been with me from the beginning. He's saying to the apostles, my Holy Spirit's going to be the one who's going to fish for men, and you're going to cooperate with my mighty, powerful spirit. He's going to bear witness, and then you're going to also bear witness. So believers in Jesus, the real power behind bringing people to Christ is the spirit of Christ, and you and I are the also. We cooperate. Now I'm going to read the passage. As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee... He saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. Okay. There's a, there's a promise but there's a condition to be met in order to achieve that, achieve that promise. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men, but what did he say that we had to do? Follow him. You've got to follow in order to fish. You're commanded to fish, but you've got to follow in order to fish. Sharing your faith with somebody else is not something that on your own, in your flesh, you're going to conjure up. Now, I know that there are type A people, you know, that would, would try to lead a gas pump to Jesus. I mean, you know, they're just always doing that. And, you know, sometimes they do it like a bull in the china closet, don't they? You know, I can remember one particular time, there was a guy that had been visiting our church, and he'd been coming to Sunday school, you know, and, and we'd talk to him some about the Lord, and, and I had an evangelist with me who will not be brought back. And this evangelist said, oh, well, you got somebody for me to go see? I said, well, let's go see this guy, you know, and we go and we visit him. And, you know, you've been talking, and you, you understand how conversations go ever since you've been a couple of years old. And you know when somebody's ready for you to shut up. Right? Okay. Don't look at me like you're ready for me to shut up. We're not even close. 
But you know when somebody has said, well, the conversation over, I don't want to talk about this anymore. They might not use those particular words, but that's what this guy said to this evangelist. You know, the evangelist came to him and he gave him the gospel like he'd already been given, you know. And they go, well, you know, I'll sure think about that. And okay, and 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 I've got this that I've got to do and I've got that I've got to do. In other words, he was saying very clearly, time to quit. Time to quit. And he didn't leave and he persisted. He kept on and he kept on and he kept on. And I promise you, this guy prayed a prayer that he didn't mean to get the evangelist to go away. And you know what? We never saw him darken the door of that church again. Okay. So he went, the evangelist went fishing without following. There was something that was not right in the heart and attitude of that evangelist, or he would have respected that man's space. It's show and tell. You show the character of Jesus and you tell the truth of Jesus. It's not one or the other. It's both and. And in this passage, it says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You're following him. Because when you follow him, for example, when a rabbi would say, follow me, what he would mean was you become my disciple and let me teach you. When Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, that was something that a rabbi would say to somebody who he wants to be his disciple. And Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. In other words, it fits you just right. You know, learn of me. And so that's the first thing. If you're going to fish for men, the more you know of God's truth, the more effective you're going to be as a fisherman. So part of following him is learn his truth. Learn his truth. But how ignorant are some of us? You know, some of us maybe know one or two scriptures. And what? We've got 52 scriptures on our website anytime you want to go there for memorizing. You know, and we've got a printout of all of the Old Testament events to help you get a basic understanding of what was leading up to the New Testament. It's there day after day if you want to go to the church website and see it. We've got it printed out if you want to see it in paper and want to put it on your refrigerator along with pictures of your grandkids. You know, we've got it available to you. What have you done with it? Learn his truth. The more you know his, know his truth, the more effective you can be in sharing your faith with the Lord Jesus Christ, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Follow me. Learn from me. Also, what does his truth do for you? It transforms you. Not only does it make you a better witness, it gives you a better walk. You talk the talk and you walk the walk. People see that moral, honest, loving, kind lifestyle that you've got. Also, if you follow him, that means that you're yielding to his control in your life. The Bible says what? Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Greek present tense, which means consistent over and over action. In other words, keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep on confessing your sins. Keep on asking him to give you grace to overcome your sins. Keep on giving him control of your life. Like a lady, the, the, one of the pianists in Crowell, Texas, where I pastored, she said, sometimes I say to the Lord, Lord, if you don't take charge of me, I'm going to sin. That's pretty well what we're talking about. You let the Holy Spirit take control of you. That's part of following him. You learn his truth and you yield to his spirit. And if that's the case, then what? Fruit. You see, they don't just hear the truth. They sample the fruit. There's a life that backs up what you're saying. If you're talking about how wonderful the Lord is and how great it is to be a Christian and and you have an obviously sinful lifestyle, they're not going to take your witness seriously. But if the fruit of the Spirit is popping out on you, one of the branches, then they're going to understand that there's something about Christianity that has affected your life. An attractive life. And what does it say? The kindness of the Lord leads to repentance. Well, where are they going to see that? We're going to see it from the body of Christ. Chick-fil-A. Their mission statement begins this way. 
to glorify God by being faithful stewards of what he has entrusted to us. Clearly a Christian business, a Christian organization. Uh, they caught a lot of flack because they came out, their CEO, um, Dan Cathy, said the Bible says that marriage is supposed to be between a man and a woman. And they caught a lot of flack for that. And a lot of the Chick-fil-A restaurants had demonstrators that would come uh, demonstrating for gay marriage, and they fed them chicken. Yeah. They sampled love from these people. You know, they were saying, oh, you, you hate homosexuals. No, the Bible says that homosexuality is a sin, but sin can be forgiven and sin can be overcome. And there are people who have left that lifestyle. So it's not hate, it's just speaking the truth in love. But Chick-fil-A demonstrates consistently the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a thing here from 2004. And it's actually from a man who gives his, his name, and he even gives a couple of phone numbers. His name's Robert Mitchell. He says, in the town of Boone, North Carolina, a Chick-fil-A was built, and all the parents and children were thrilled to have a restaurant with great food and awesome indoor playground. There was one little girl who couldn't enjoy the food because her chemo treatments made all the food tasteless. She was most disappointed, however, that she was not able to play on the new, really awesome-looking playground that she saw so often on her way to the doctor's office. This was because her immune system was nearly non-existent, and her parents and doctors were concerned that she might pick up a bad germ. One particular day that she was at the doctor's office, the manager of Chick-fil-A, who just so happens to be the husband of her favorite nurse and was bringing her lunch, knelt down before the little girl and asked if she had been to the new restaurant to play. The little girl, already upset because of finger pricks, sadly explained her health issues and the reason for her absence at the really awesome playground, and the man held her and cried with her. The next day, the little girl received a phone call from the man who had asked us to meet with him in the parking lot of Chick-fil-A the next Sunday after church. The mom said, I thought you were closed on Sundays. He said, well, we are but I have a surprise for your little girl. Oh, and make sure she has play clothes and brings her best friend. That Sunday after church, the little girl, her dad, her best friend, and her mom went to Chick-fil-A. The manager locked the door behind them and with his church clothes on, disinfected the entire area from top to bottom twice. He served them cold fountain drinks and ice cream and then played with the little girls until they could play no longer. Then the owner came in for a while, and he also played with the little girls and chatted with the parents and made sure they had all they needed. I know this story to be true because the little girl is my daughter, Michaela. She will never forget the sacrifice and kindness of these people. She will forever love Alex and Bing for loving her. And now that she is cancer-free, Chick-fil-A is the best chicken, in her opinion. Yeah. Speaking the truth in love, it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, is how the church grows. Not just speaking the truth, that's fishing. But speaking the truth in love, that's fishing having followed Jesus. We follow in order to fish. If you fish without following, you're fishing in your flesh. And sometimes it's powerless and sometimes it's rude and it's ineffective. But if you follow first then the Spirit of God makes you a fisher of men, which is why the Apostle Peter is mentioned like he is, because in his flesh he denied Jesus, but filled with the Spirit of God, he fished, and he fished effectively. Truth, know God's truth, that's part of following Jesus, yielding to the Spirit of God so that you show fruit, Truth and fruit, but also if he makes you a fisher of men as you're following him, he gives you boldness. This is going to look like a rabbit, but I promise you this is planned. Did you know that Satan hates God? <gasps> oh, you didn't know that, did you? Of course you know that. Why does he hate God? Well, he hates God because he wanted to be worshipped as God, and God said, I'm God and you're not, and now you're in deep trouble. He rebelled against God. A third of the angels rebelled with him, and their motivation was pride. They wanted to be worshipped. They wanted to be glorified as opposed to God being glorified. So he hates God. You ever try to hurt God? 
You know, take him on in a fight. You can't hurt God, but you can grieve him. The Bible says even Christians can grieve God. They can grieve the Spirit of God, Ephesians 4.30. You know, we can grieve him. And so Satan understands that he can't hurt God, but he can grieve God. Because God loves people. God loves people. People are, committed, are, are created in his image. He loves us dearly. We are worth dying for. And whenever a crook by the name of Zacchaeus came to faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. You know, you're, you're wicked, you're cruel, you're dishonest. You're a human being made in my image, and I'm coming to die for you. By the way, he was on his way to Jerusalem for the last time to be crucified whenever Zacchaeus got saved. He was making a point. This guy's valuable to me. People are valuable to me. So God loves people. God was willing to go to the cross in the person of Jesus so that he could have people back with him. And so if Satan can keep God from getting the people that he loves... He's going to do it. And one thing that I have noticed, he doesn't seem to get terribly upset if we feed the hungry and we clothe the naked and we visit the sick and, and, you know, hospitals, orphanages, all kinds of things have been put together by Christians. And some of those things I'm sure bother Satan. But you want to get resistance, you start to share your faith in Jesus Christ so that that person can pass from death into life, so that person can pass from being lost to being saved, to being somebody separated from God who loves him, to somebody who's in the family of God, then's when you're going to get resistance. I've been in people's homes before sharing my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it comes to the point where I say, well, can you think of anything that can keep you from praying to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord? And the phone will ring, or the doorbell will ring. Or a baby will cry. Or some kind of distraction will come up. And it happens too often to be a coincidence. So understand this. He might not try to stop you from planting a garden for people or from buying gas for somebody or for giving to a charity. But when it comes to sharing your faith with somebody else, expect to be intimidated. Expect to be interrupted because there's the point where somebody that God loves can get with the God who loves them and Satan who wants to grieve God is going to stand in the way. So understand that when you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, not only does he give you his truth because you're learning from him and not only does he give you his fruit because his spirit is controlling you, taking charge of you, but also he gives you boldness. What did Paul say to Timothy? 2 Timothy 1.7. God has not given us the spirit of timidity, but of power and love and a sound mind. Why do you say that to Timothy? Tendency to get scared. You know what the apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6? After he was talking about put on the whole armor of God, put all the armor on, and then praying in the spirit with all, you know. Then he said, pray for me that I will share the truth with boldness. Paul, Paul saying, pray for me that I be bold. It's because Jesus makes you fishers of men, not only by giving you truth if you follow him, not only giving you fruit if you follow him, but giving you boldness. But you've got to follow to fish. If you don't follow, you won't fish. You'll do all kinds of nice things maybe. But when it comes to Stepping across that bridge to leads to talking about the Lord Jesus Christ or walking through that door that's been opened for you, you won't do it. You won't have the boldness to do it. And you will actually have demonic resistance. But the boldness that do, to do it comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll make you a fisher of men. He did it for Peter. He did it for Paul. He does it for every believer. But then also he empowers it. Before he went back where he came from, what did he say? You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses. And remember the John 15 passage that we read. When the helper comes, he will testify about me. 
he supplies the power. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, oh my goodness, that's one of, one of the passages that a lot of us, we can quote 19 and 20, you know, go ye into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you. But that's the meat of the sandwich. There are two pieces of bread. The first one is verse 18 where he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth before he makes the command. And then what's the last thing he says in verse 20? I'm with you always. You understand, here's the command to fish. Go out and make disciples. But before he gives the command, he says, now I've got all the power in heaven and earth. And when he finishes the command, he says, now I haven't gone anywhere. I'm going to be with you to the end of the age. I have all power and I'm with you. I'm going to empower your witness. But what have you got to do to fish? follow. 1 Peter 3.15. This was one of our Bible school verses. Sanctify Jesus as Lord in your heart. Follow. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account of the hope that's in you with reverence and fear. Okay, Be ready. It doesn't say force the door open. It doesn't say, build the bridge. It says, follow Jesus and be ready. And sometimes you'll go through a whole day and there's no open door and there's no bridge to cross. And, and you, you know, you've lived a consistent Christian life and the fruit is showing. But then there'll be other days it might be two or three times. Be ready. And you're ready if you're following. And I'm done. Time for meditation. Some things to maybe ask the Lord. Lord, am I fishing? Lord, if the answer is no, why? The, the why is that you're not following, so there's something in your life that you're not following Jesus with? Is there some area of your life that you want him to leave alone? You know, there's some things that are really, really important in our lives. Family? Whoa. Job? Sometimes our hobbies, sometimes maybe our hobbies take up too much of our attention. There's something, there's some area in your life that's not yielded to the Lord while you're not fishing. Now, of course, now understand that if, if you're ready, if you're ready to fish, then when the door opens, you'll walk through it. And maybe there wasn't an open door this past week. You need to ask God, have I been fishing? If the answer is no, why? Some adjustments need to be made. Okay. Am I following, Lord? Is there anything in my life that I'm holding back from you? Maybe you need to make a commitment also. Lord, I need to learn your word. I mean, part of following you is letting you teach me. Will you make a commitment to learn his word? A youth, you memorize a verse a day. You know, you can say a verse 30 times and it's yours. 30 times and it's yours. You've memorized it. If you say it to yourself out loud 30 times. How long does that take? It doesn't take that long. Learn God's Word. You know, but look at the things that we spend our time on. How, how much Scripture could you learn if you just did away with one particular 30-minute TV program? Or 30 minutes on your phone playing games? You know, some people give up lunch to get in God's Word and learn God's Word. It renews our mind. It changes us. It makes us more and more like Christ. It makes us more and more effective fishermen. And some of us, we're going to come to the end of our life and we're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and he's going to ask what we did with what he gave us. And he commanded us to fish. And some of us are going to stand in front of him and be ashamed because we didn't do what he told us to do. 
We took the everlasting life that he wanted to give to us and we did it our way instead of following him. Okay, I promise I'm really done now. Let's take some time to meditate. God bless you. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. If you guys would stand up with us. I sing, oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before him for he is Lord of all sing hallelujah Christ is risen you guys have a great week this week God bless you